Don't you love it when we um click start the show and then it's like the numbers just start going? <laughs> okay, right now it looks like one of those lottery things where the numbers just spin and spin because these <laughs> numbers are flying. And that warms my heart. A big hello to everybody. Welcome back our frequent flyers to those new to the show. Welcome, welcome. I just absolutely love it. And you know what I love is the numbers go up and then our frequent flyers put in the chat. Good morning. Hi, Christine. <laughs> Always good to see you here. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. And we're going to talk in a little bit about how important our audience is, aren't we, Lauren? Yes, we are. It <laughs> we're going to have coming. a conversation about that, and I'll tell you guys why. It's a good <laughs> one. It's a good Lori one. You're going to love it, okay? <laughs> good morning, April. Good morning, Christine. Lori, I'm going to go ahead and jump into yep. my intro so that you can get started. Sounds good. So let's go ahead and share this screen. Good morning to everyone, to our frequent flyers, to those of you who are brand new to us. We are super excited to have you. Um, let me go ahead and jump into the intro. My name is Lauren Simpson. I am with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. We are a national program with over a thousand locations across the country, and we offer no cost services to local small businesses. Now, as you've heard me say before, if you've been with us, you know, as our frequent flyers, uh, but those of you who are new, just know that our services are at no cost to you because your tax dollars have already taken care of all of our fees. Now for the Los Angeles Regional Network, we have several locations throughout the Santa Barbara, Ventura, and uh, Los Angeles counties. And you can see those um, physical centers uh, delineated by the uh, red way marks that you see on the map in front of you. You will see that we are in Santa Clarita, Camarillo, Pasadena, out to Laverne which is that way mark all the way over by Ontario. We are throughout Los Angeles, the South Bay, down into Long Beach. Now I mentioned those free services. We offer no cost business advising. And so you're able to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our business experts. And we have experts in um, various fields from marketing to uh, if you're just starting out, um, creating a business plan. Um, if you are looking to tackle your numbers, we have a guru of all numbers, Miss Lori Williams, you can get a session with her. Uh, honestly, you name it, we've got it from taxes to, again, marketing to uh, schematics, uh, anything you can think of, we've got it for you. And then we also offer virtual trainings. Now, those are going to be deeper dives. Those are comprehensive workshops that assist you in beginning your uh, business, adapting and or growing. So now here's your chance to get in contact with us. Be sure to jot down either our phone number or website. You can go to smallbizla.org forward slash new client or call us at 866-588-7232. And then if you have reached us and you are outside of our service area, that means you are outside of the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara or Ventura counties. Please go to americasbdc.org forward slash find your SBDC. Now, really quickly, before we jump into the juicy stuff, the fun stuff, um, <laughs> be sure to put all questions into the Q&A. Again, put those questions into the Q&A. We want to be sure that Lori sees them and we don't miss them. And then just take a look at the chat. The chat is going to be filled with information for you to get in contact with uh, Lori or our guest. Uh, we will also have information related to our YouTube playlist. So you can click that link there. And then you can also join the party. So that's where our frequent flyers and those of you who are new to us uh, can jump in on the conversation as it relates to the topic at hand. That said, Lori, I'm going to kick it over to you. You've got some really fun stuff coming up. I sure do. And you know, Lauren, I got to go back. I got to go back two shows. And there's these things that have been said that just stick with me. So I got to go back to um, automation needs supervision. I love that. You know, so that way, if you're syncing your data, remember automation needs supervision. And then from our lovely discussion with Emma, all during the week, and I see Emma's in, in the chat there, all I kept thinking about is when Emma said, I have grit. I thought that was so awesome. And you know what? In, in today's world, whether we're talking about business or personal, having grit is important. And I thought that was the expression that I held all week. So thank you, Emma, for the expression of having 
having grit. Let's everybody have a little more grit than we had yesterday, okay? Um, so here is my words of wisdom, and I'm going to bring up a topic that I'm going to start discussing, and I'm going to take up next week, and I'll tell you more about that. So I want to first talk about financial versus managerial accounting. I express this all the time. I talk about it in my financial literacy series, but for those of you who have not heard about it or may not be totally sure of what I'm speaking about, I want to bring it up because this is going to be a foundation I'm going to launch from. So when we think about financial accounting, we're thinking about QuickBooks, if I use that just as an expression, it could be any accounting software. We're thinking about a profit and loss statement, a balance sheet. We're thinking about reporting on our taxes. We're thinking about reporting any kind of documents if we're going for a bank loan. We're thinking about filling out our seller's permit. So what you're doing is you're collecting data or information about the transactions that are occurring in the business in order to fill out a report or another way of saying it is to have an outside investor of some port, whether it's the investor of the um, taxes, IRS wants to look at your numbers, the franchise tax boards wants to look at, you know, some of your numbers, the um, the department of, I forget what it is now for selling permits, but they want to look at how much sales you have. So think about collecting data on transactions to fill out a form or have somebody externally look at the numbers. Now in that, all companies that are 26 million or less, which is a bulk of our small companies, you know, that's a pretty big number, 26 million. So all of them 26 million or less, these reports I'm speaking of are set up on what's called a cash basis. Cash in, cash out. Now it's great that the IRS requires requires companies 26 million or less to report their financials on a cash basis. Why it's a good thing? Because it's simpler. It, it's an easier accounting method. So for small companies to not have the burden of accrual accounting, which would be the opposite, um, and not have to have a whole accounting staff, it makes perfect sense to do it on a cash accounting. And that's why it's done that way. However, when it comes to managing the company, making decisions, can I afford to hire somebody? Can we afford rent? Are we charging at the same price, right price? Are our costs in alignment? All of those questions that you ask on a daily basis and you may go to bed worrying about and wake up in the morning worrying about, those questions cannot be answered through your internal documents under financial accounting, especially if there is certain timing on your cash basis. So for this reason, you need managerial accounting. Managerial accounting is simply meaning you need a lot of separate documents that look at numbers in a different way. Um, I like to say spreadsheets because spreadsheets are an ideal format, whether it's Google, Numbers, or Excel, you know, but spreadsheets allow you to put formulas in. We're talking about very basic math, add, subtract, multiply, divide, nothing fancy. But what you're doing is you're extracting that data. You're extracting the data from your financial accounting, from your reports, and you're aligning it based on a key question or something you want to manage within your company. Okay, so a question could be, am I profitable when I'm selling the products? Am I profitable after overhead? Am I profitable on a certain product or a service? All of these questions that you ask, they cannot be answered through your financial accounting. So a misnomer that small businesses have is they believe that big companies just manage like a CFO, like I've been in companies, interim CFO for different companies, especially when I did a lot of turnarounds that I managed through these financial accounting systems. No, I had a ton of Excel or spreadsheet documents that I would use to manage the company to make the decisions. And I would update those weekly, daily, monthly, depending on the transactions of the company. If you look at any large company and you go into the computer files of the CFO, you're gonna see a ton of documents, a ton of documents. And those are the ones they're using to make decisions. So with a small company, they don't even realize this necessity exists. This is what my session two and session three is all about. So now that I've talked about the managerial versus financial accounting, what I'm gonna leave at at this point is the power of asking questions. We too often think it's the answers that matter. What really matters is the questions. If we don't ask the right questions, the answers don't matter. 
You know, it's asking the right questions. So when you're running your company, asking questions like what would happen if, what are the vulnerabilities of the company? Are we selling at the right price? What would happen if cost went up? What would happen if our rent went up? These are the power of these questions, which the answers then give you strategic alternatives and allow you to do what I call course corrections. So my, my words of wisdom today is really a foundational explanation to carry forth to next week. It's first of all, understanding that if you don't have a different documents that are helping you to manage financially within your company, you're not properly financially managing your company. If you don't have questions being asked and then these documents able to answer the questions, you could be making decisions that will back you in a corner, causing you to not have cash flow, close your company and not be able to make course corrections. That's not to engage in fear, that's more to state the power of having this understanding. So I'm gonna pick up more on that next week and I will explain where. So financial literacy session two and session three, if you miss session one, you can jump in on session two and session three. I do advise taking session two and three together. It's a little bit easier to understand. Also bringing back my best legal structure for my company. Now, upcoming shows, this is where we go into January 24th next week. We're going to have an audience participation, as I'm calling it. Okay, guys in the chat, laugh at Lori. Here's the true story, because I always tell you the truth. Just had a conversation with Lauren. Hey, Lauren, um, next week is Leo. No, Lauren says that's January 31st. I go, yeah, that's next week. She goes, no, next week is January 24th. I go, there's another week in January? Uh-oh, I have nobody scheduled for next week because I didn't put it on the calendar when I created my schedule. Okay, yeah. You're right. So Lauren said, what do you want to do next week? And I thought I could grab a guest real quick. I could. But what about audience participation? We've done that before and it turned out to be great. I'm going to have a few topics. I'm going to dwell in, delve more into what I spoke about in the words of wisdom. Lauren's going to put your e her email in the chat right now. If there's a topic you want to talk about, let me know. Your guys are going to be the show again. And we had that happen. I don't remember. It's been some months when one of our guests just didn't show up. And it turned out to be so much fun because we talked about all kinds of topics. And you know, with me, you give me a topic, I can talk about it. So we're going to have this fun show. You're going to put in what you want to talk about. You're going to put in any questions. I'm going to have some subject matter if you guys don't have anything. And we're just going to go with the flow and have a blast. Probably won't have one of these for a little bit. So please join Join us next week. Think about anything you want to talk about, and we're going to have an open conversation. All things are on the table, okay? Then January 31st, we're going to have Leo and Chris come on, and it's going to be a great show. This is a um, very powerful duel. They have Ritual Asibar, and they started this company some time ago. Leo's going to tell you the story, and they're just, I would call, up young upcoming entrepreneurs. I'm very um, excited to know them. I've been working with them on some of their numbers, some of the managerial accounting, and asked them to come on and talk about their story. I think it's going to be educational, and these guys are inspirational. They just are a lot of lot of power behind them. Um, I wanted to have Samara come back on. She is my resident HR person. I know she talked about new HR laws that are coming up in January. We didn't get a lot of time to delve into them. I want everybody to be aware of it. And I'm going to ask her to come on and kind of begin a discussion like this. Okay, we're at a situation where we're only ourselves in our company. We're thinking about hiring that one person, AB5 maybe required it. What happens when we go from zero employees to even a part-time employee? What happens when we go from a part-time to one? So we're going to kind of go a sequencing of events to help you make that decision with a little bit more understanding of what it involves. So that's going to be happening next week. Now for this week, I'm real excited to have David Horvitz back on. David is a certified financial planner professional. He has been practicing comprehensive financial planning since 2002. He is skilled in the areas of taxation, mitigation, retirement planning, estate planning, insurance, and personal risk management. Thank you for coming back on the show, David. Good to have you on the show. It's great to be back, Lori. Thanks for having me. 
Now, we were talking about a couple things before the show, and one of them that I was expressing is that I wasn't sure when I first had your subject matter on whether it was going to be a great subject matter for our audience. And in doing so, I, I would say the word, David, after even three quarters into our conversation, I was very humbled. I was like, wait a minute, there's a lot of information here, and this is something that all small companies, no matter where they are in their financial status, really need to have an awareness of. And so I wanted to bring you back on because I kind of jumped around all over the place in our last conversation and you followed beautifully, but you started to speaking of a sequence of events of consideration of what plans to engage in. So I wanted to pick up on that. But the second thing that I found, I got to say, just charming, I'm going to use the word charming, was the story of how you became a financial planner. It was not at all what I expected. So I would like you, for people who aren't familiar, didn't see the first show, do an introduction of your background, but please do tell us that charming story of how you got started, okay? Thank you. It's one of my most uh, favorite stories to tell, so I'd be happy to share it. Um well, so I was a, a teacher. I'd been a, an elementary school teacher for the first 10 years of my career out of college. And uh, in 2002, my hero, my grandfather, who was my hero, passed away. And uh, my grandmother called me up and said, well, your grandfather left behind some money for me, uh, but absolutely no instructions. And because he was the one who had his finger on the pulse of all of our financial, uh, all of our financials, um, I don't know what to do. And now I've got uh, lawyers calling me and stockbrokers calling me and real estate people and a CPA who says he's done our accounting for the last 20 years and I've never met him. And I really don't know how to make any decisions about this. So you have to help me. And I said, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. What makes you think that that I know this stuff. And she said, well, if you don't know it, you better go learn it. So <laughs> I immediately enrolled in uh, UCLA Extension and started taking courses at night in personal financial planning while I was continuing to teach. And every week I would go and, and visit and say, ah, I learned what an IRA is. Oh, I understand what this brokerage account is. And we need to talk to this person and we don't need to talk to this person anymore. And bit by bit, I was uh, able to piece together a good comprehensive financial plan for my grandmother. Um, and at the same time, I started learning uh, well, not quite all there is to know, but a lot of what is important in personal financial planning. Um, and by the way, I still see her every week. She's 98 years old. Um, <laughs> we spend most of the time talking about her cats and uh, not about financial things, but uh, um, it gives me great pleasure because, you know, it's been well, well 21 years since, since that whole process started. And uh, um, I'm so grateful to have had that experience so that I can bring the same kind of service to my clients. And basically what it comes down to is having the cash you need when you need it and setting yourself up so that you do have the cash you need when you need it. You know, I love the story because I feel like it's a learning through a labor of love. I feel like my road down financial understanding was in a way a labor of love and it was love for myself. I wanted to get myself out of that angst that I felt running my first company, which was a marketing company and not understanding anything. So I think that's a lovely story. Now, speaking of that, where I want to go next with this, David, is just kind of start with the summary, begin with the end in mind. And we were talking once again before the show and something I was expressing is that over the years, I've actually kind of lucked out where I've done well with choosing the right type of retirement vehicles. I'm not saying I couldn't have done better, but I've done pretty good. Now, the reason that I was able to is that I recognized, and with the help of my accountant back years ago, that you know, basically we got down to this discussion where he would say, well, you owe this much in taxes. And I would say, I don't want to pay 
that much in taxes. You know, this is the, this is Lori, right? I just, I don't want to, I just don't want to, you know, that's the way it is. Right. And he says, well, what you could do. And I remember the first thing he said is you can open a SEP IRA and then you can put this money in. I didn't have the whole amount that I even could put in that was allowed. I didn't have that much, David, but he said, if you put this in, instead of sending it to the government, it'll go here. That's what I heard. I heard I didn't even have the full contribution limit. I didn't make that much. But I heard that this money goes here for me versus the government. And that rung a bell in my ears. OK. And so over the years, I recognize that it's not about so much. Well, I'm not making money to put in it yet. I'm not there yet. If you owe a dollar in taxes, that could be a dollar you don't pay in taxes. Now, fast forward, I've gone through having the, the SEP to having a corporation to setting up a 401 for myself, not having employees doing the max contribution, and I am lowering my taxable income, huge amounts, huge amounts, right? So now I'm at a different financial status, but I'm still doing the I don't want to pay that money to the government, right? So, but the other thing that I noticed, David, is I was expressing to you is that the amount of vehicles, I call them vehicles just being a finance, you know, an IRA, a solo IRA, this new thing called a solo 401, which I don't even know what that is, right? There's all these words that didn't exist when I was trying to choose. And I was looking at it the other day because people asked me questions and they asked me a questions like, can I do a, a, a SAP with a um, LLC and have matching? And I said, I don't know. And in my head, what the answer was no. And then I found out the answer was yes. So I'm going to turn this back to you with this comment. There is a lot of opportunity and options out there. They're very confusing. They seem to make big differences in whether you have employees or not. They make big differences in whether you can match. They're tied into the profit of the company. So you have to have a percentage that you can give to the company. And they can. there's a progression of where you're at. You can always start with something independent if you're making a lot of money, but you can get different vehicles along the way. I want to really give the platform to you to go in the direction you see rather than me asking the questions. So you take some linear progression to help take away the confusion. I'm throwing oh, it back to you. Okay, very good. I'll, I'll I'll do my best. And and if anything comes up and just feel free to cut me off and we can go down a, a new road or whatever you'd like to do. Um, it, there are, there is a, a wide spectrum of retirement plan choices for small business owners and, by the way, for employees. Um, and this all sort of came out of a, a history where in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, starting towards the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, it used to be you are an employee of a big company and you put in your time and at the end of your 25 years or whatever it is, you get your gold watch and you get your pension. And the pension is the company's obligation to pay you a portion of your salary for the rest of your life. And so it, there really wasn't that much responsibility put on the employee to think about retirement planning. And um, that sort of carried over when people became self-employed as well, where I really don't know what the options are. I'm not, I'm not GM or, you know, some big company where I have to think about uh, long-term pensions for all of the employees. So I probably don't have to think about it very much at all. And I'm not sure that there's much that I could do anyway. I might not be that profitable or really even profitable at all. Bingo. That's where a lot of our audience are right there. That's what they're thinking. So perfect. Keep going. <laughs> well, you hit the nail on the head when you said, if you're paying a dollar in tax, then there most likely is an opportunity for you to shelter that money in a retirement plan to avoid the tax in the current year and increase your savings over time. Now, I say avoid the tax in the current year because you eventually will have to pay tax on the money when you take it out. There really is no way to avoid the tax altogether, but you can defer it and you can keep more of your money for yourself, have it grow for your own benefit um, 
because you're not paying taxes in that current year. Also, David, on that, yeah. can we point out, because some of the younger generation, they don't, and, and I didn't understand this at one time, when we say we got to pay taxes sooner or later, the concept is when you're older, your income is lower. So the amount of tax you pay on that money is less, or another way of saying it, you're in a lower tax bracket when you're older than you are during your earning. I just want to throw that, throw that part in because a lot of people miss that concept that you're still paying taxes, but you won't be paying as much as you are today. Yes. Um, and uh, and I will explain that. What that really is about is, just generally speaking, the longer that you can avoid paying taxes, even if you eventually do have to pay it, the better it is for you. It's like this idea of, would you rather have a dollar today or one dollar in a year's time or 10 years time? You'd always rather have the dollar today. So if you can keep your dollar today, even if you have to end up paying it later, it's still better to keep it today because you can get the growth on that dollar. Well, it's the same thing with retirement planning. And many of the retirement plans are designed to lower your tax in the present and have your income grow. And then when you eventually pay tax in the future, if you are in fact in a lower tax bracket, which you may very well be and most likely will be, then the tax that you have to pay is a smaller percentage than you would have had to pay way back then when you saved it in the, you know, in your retirement plan in the beginning. Um, and, and in terms of options, uh, going back to, as you said, if you if you owe tax, there is the opportunity for you to shelter that money in a retirement plan. And the retirement plans, the way I like to think about it on the spectrum, it kind of goes from very simple and cheap or free to establish, um, but does not allow you to shelter that much from income tax to mm -hmm. complex and which allows you to shelter a lot more from tax, but is more expensive to establish and maintain. That makes sense to me, yeah. Okay, so on the, the lower end, which is, is going to uh, probably be appropriate for your audience who are not earning very much in income or um, uh, doesn't have the... Um, the, the extra uh, discretionary spending ability that they can put money in a in a big plan, um, th they're going to probably gravitate towards towards this end, and that is that's going to start with either a traditional or a Roth IRA. Okay. An IRA stands for an Individual Retirement Arrangement, and it is available to anyone. Anyone can fund an IRA, whether or not your funding that IRA is going to reduce your taxes in the current year depends on how much money you make. Now, the limitation on how much that you can put into an IRA in 2024 is $7,000 or 100% of your earned income, whatever is less, plus another extra thousand if you're 50 or older. So if you make $25,000 after uh, all of your expenses in your um, in your business, you could put seven thousand or eight thousand if you're fifty or older into an IRA, and that's going to reduce your taxable income by that seven or eight thousand. And what I'm going to do, and David, this is a key point that people miss, and you said it eloquently, and I want to just go back and hone on it. It has to do with your net income. So if you have on your taxes a loss, you can't put the money away. You have no money to put away. So you have to be very con conscious of the fact that, yes, it's great to not pay taxes, but you have, don't have a profit. You can't take from any money to put it away, that there's a, a relationship between your net income and your ability to invest in a retirement. I just wanted to come back and say that again. Many times people miss that. Please continue. Sure. Yeah. And that that's correct. There is a vehicle that you actually don't have to be profitable net oh. income from the, the, on the business side to be able to fund it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So you have this, this very basic one, which is 
the traditional IRA, which will lower your taxes in the year that you contribute to it, or a Roth IRA, which does not lower your taxes in the year in which you contribute, but it does grow tax-free. And when you take the money out, you don't pay any tax versus the traditional one, which grows tax-free. But when you take the money out that you do pay taxes. Can so, I ask something yeah. on that, David? That's a really good point. So I, over the years, just from different advice, I you know had a Roth IRA, then I had a, a SEP IRA, and I had also just a brokerage account because I was putting money in, right? Well, now I'm older. <laughs> so I was looking at my finances a couple years ago and I was thinking because somebody told me, you know, I, I was around somebody much older than me and they said, well, yeah, now I got to pay taxes on this. So I have to make sure I consider it. So I said to myself, well, if I think I have this much money, I got to look at taxes. Well, that was when and only when, David, that I realized there is a benefit to the Roth, because when I looked at the overall pot of money I had put away, between the brokerage, that was not a retirement, and the Roth, I had a substantial amount that I had already paid taxes. So when I go to take the money out when I'm older, I have a mixture of some that I have to pay taxes on, some I do not have to pay taxes on. And I got a big aha moment. That's why we also choose a Roth. That's why we can also choose a brokerage. The blended amount really benefits. So that was my aha aha moment on the difference between putting the money away without paying taxes on it, retirement, putting the money away after paying taxes on. Am I kind of correct in my aha moment? Totally. Uh, the, the, you used the exact word that we use, which is blended. So blended taxable income in retirement is uh, such a benefit in as much as, okay, I need X amount of money a month and I have different pots that I can pull from and the tax ramifications from pulling from each of those pots is going to be different. So Ooh. from my Roth, it's going to be tax free from my traditional IRA. It's going to be fully taxable. And then from my brokerage account, it's kind of going to be a mixture of capital gains tax and tax free from the right. basis. So what's the best mix that's going to give me the greatest amount of income and paying the least amount of tax. Maybe it's to take a little bit from my taxable IRA and a lot from my Roth, or maybe because my taxable income otherwise is going to be put me in a very low tax bracket, I take more from my taxable income and less from my Roth to save that for later. But this is something that you do, you know, as needed as you're right. uh, living in retirement uh, to, to, get there in the in the uh, accumulation phase um that's that's where you start saying well what 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 is available to me what can i afford what's going to create the greatest tax benefit either in the moment or if i can think about it that way in the future and can i create these different diversification buckets um by being intelligent about how I contribute to my... And this comes back to what you're saying is on the lower end of the sector, well, I don't want to say lower, but on the where we're talking now, for the individual that isn't making a lot of money, doesn't have a lot of options, they can have a traditional IRA or a traditional Roth giving them both of those options when they retire. Granted, they're probably going to go down the road and get in other vehicles as well, but there is a platform of two choices and the reason one would choose one over over another. Yes, that that's that's it exactly. And um, like I said, the, those reasons are dependent on the type of income that you're making, whether or not you can afford to put money away, or um, what the tax ramifications would be by choosing one or the other. Now, is it also a true statement to say, and I want to build this in as we're, we're going through the sequence, the full allowable contribution, depending on my age, is divided amongst these vehicles. I can't say, I want to put this such in a Roth. I want, we got to get that understanding that we may choose different options, but that total contribution amount sent by the IRS is still a total contribution allowable amount. Even if you have a four, I'm saying something, you correct me. Okay, David, say I happen to be having a company, I'm doing a Schedule C, a, you know, whatever, a sole prop, but I also am an employee. That 
contribution level means what did I contribute at the company and personal? I can't say, well, the company doesn't count because I'm an employee and then I can do it in the personal. All these go across all angles to that main contribution amount. Is that correct? It is mostly correct. Okay. Uh, and what you're talking about are uh, are there plans that that contributions to which offset each other? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the answer is most of them do offset each other. So I have a SEP IRA and I have a Roth IRA. Well, if I contribute my seven thousand dollars to my Roth IRA, it reduces the amount that I'm allowed to contribute to my SEP IRA, and vice gotcha. versa. Gotcha. However, there are some plans that do not offset each other, and you're able to make a full contribution to that one and to that one, which is a you know more on the sophisticated more on the complex the side. But what I what I love right now is we've got a good foundation. We understand the difference between Roth. We understand the difference between a retirement that has the money not taxed at the time. And we understand contribution levels are set by the IRS. And for the most part, we understand that number is a number that is across all the different platforms that we use that needs to add up. So this gives us a realization that even if we're getting into complex different structures, there's some main questions or concepts that are just really key carried through with all this thoughts. That's true. And, um, you know, I know I described this sort of as a spectrum, but it, it kind of is like a spectrum and a, a tree branches. So yeah. it's sort of like a 3D thing yeah. and they, it can get, it can get rather complex. Um, but just to, to try to simplify it, it, it yeah. I like using that spectrum analogy, moving along the spectrum and from on the simplest end, you've, you've got your IRA, your Roth, or your traditional IRA, both of which you can contribute either uh, uh, 7,000 or 8,000, depending on your age. And as you said, you cannot contribute 7,000 to, to each of them in mm -hmm. the same year. Um, it's got to be a total of. Uh, just, just beyond that is uh, a SEP IRA or a solo 401k. Now, these are appropriate vehicles for people who own their own businesses and have no employees or their spouse is their employee. Okay. And then these aren't tied to legal structure, sole prop as corp, right? Now, it's just own my own company and it's my spouse or just me, right? That's right. Okay. Gotcha. Keep going. Yep. It does, the, the structure of the, of the entity doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So these ones um, allow you to shelter more money than the straight up IRAs of seven or 8,000. In each of them, you can, can, you can shelter about 67, 68,000, but it's dependent on your income yep. of the company, which is what you mentioned before, okay. to a degree in the solo 401k. So with the solo 401k, there are two components of contributions. The first component is the employee contribution. Now, even though you're the you're the sole owner of the business, say, you as far as the IRS is concerned, there are two types of people who are in this business: the employee and the employer. The employee gets certain privileges, and the employer gets certain privileges. Okay. As an employee with a 401k, whether you own the business or you don't, you can contribute up to $20,000 of your paycheck. So if I am the employee of my own um, plumbing business and it's a LLC or it's just a, a C corp or it's a sole prop with a schedule C, David's plumbing business pays David, the plumber, $25,000. Well, David, the employee, can contribute $20,000 of his $25,000 paycheck into the 401k, reducing David, the employee's taxable income. Okay. That goes in there, and that's where it lives. David, the employer can contribute up to 25% of the entire income from the business after all expenses. So you, the employee's contribution to the 
401k of 20,000, that's an expense, but the truck and the insurance and the advertising and so on and so forth. And if I'm left with say $100,000, the employer can contribute on, to the employee's mm -hmm. uh, 401ks 25%. So I now can put my own 20,000 and the employer's 25,000, I've got 45,000 in the 401k. The IRS says, okay, that's the employer's and that's the employee's, but I'm both. So I get the entire 45,000. Now, what I find interesting about that, and, and this is what I do with my escort, but one of the things, and once again, my, my lack of knowledge and not looking into this, I know my world. I, because when you're an S corp or taxes an S corp, the IRS technically sees you as an employee versus when you are an LLC or a sole prop, the IRS technically sees you as a self-employed person and you do not do a W-2. I had the erroneous just thought, I mean, I never even thought about it much, but when I did that, you cannot use the matching employer employee portion because you're not using a W-2, but a sole prop can and an LLC can can just based on how much of the net earnings they would have. Is that a true, true statement? Well, actually, the, the matching feature is available to any structure. Okay. It's just a delineation between the employee and the employer. And the reason that's the case is that the matching feature is determined by the plan itself, not the entities uh registration got it i understand so to bring this home to the audience because what david is saying is really important i mean the first thing we talked about is if you got a dollar tax you're paying in consider that this may be a possibility that's the first thing so guys what i do just to kind of give you a back of the envelope idea is i've got of course a spreadsheet I figure out way before the end of the year about where I'm going to be in net income. I look at the total amount I can put into my 401 by contribution, and that gives me a number, drives down the amount that the paycheck is, right? So now I'm only paying tax on, you know, like if I, I could put away 30000 So I did a 40000 check. You know, 30000 went away. I'm only paying taxes as if I got $10,000 that year, right? Then I have another cell that calculates after I take my salary of 40000 out, how much net income's left. A 25% of that, that's my employee part, right? So I might look at and say, do I want to deduct the computer this year or do I want to buy the computer next year? Well, no, look, my maximum amounts are here. I'm going to buy the computer in January and I play with the numbers to max it out. So that is just kind of a nuts and bolts of what David's saying. So maybe the audience can hone in on it because that's where when you start to have some income and it doesn't matter if I was doing the full 30,000, I'm an older, a geezer, I get that amount right in this plan. Um, but but it also is if I was only doing 5,000 because it does then drive down. I mean, you can, it, it just amazes me every year how I go, okay, I'm at this tax bracket. And then I play this, this tax bracket. So I just wanted to fill in some blanks, David, keep going. These are key points. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. And, and just to clarify, um, I'm talking right now about the plans that are appropriate for uh, solopreneurs who have no employees or spouse. And the reason I say spouse is that I'm presuming that the company owner want, is comfortable making contributions on behalf of their spouse. Yeah, And that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that back, David, because I'll tell you right now, straight up, if I had an employee, I wouldn't want to do the maximum matching to the employee. And so the point is that whatever I'm doing with myself, I would have to offer it to my employee. I'm being very aggressive on my tax strategy of contributing because I'm not having to match it for an employee. I'm not having to offer that to employees. If I had to offer it to employees, it's a whole different financial decision. Thank you for bringing that point back up, David. Very good. Sure. And uh, let's just talk about that for just a moment. So suppose that uh, I am making enough money where I'd be comfortable putting away 20000 or if I'm of age 30000 away for myself. Um, I'm not comfortable doing it for my employees. And I, I have employees. I've got three employees. None of them is my spouse. And uh, I love them, but I'm not really interested in 
compensating them more than we've already agreed on through salary. Well, does that mean that my only choice is the regular old IRA that we talked about a few minutes ago? The answer is no. The 401k, the same one that I described before, which was called the solo 401k, this is your traditional uh, 401k, which is not a solo. It costs usually about $1,500 to establish and then about $1,000 a year to administer. That one would allow me to put away uh, 30000 if I'm over 50, provided that my earnings are at least uh, 30000 and not contribute anything on behalf of the employees. The employees can also put away up to 30000 if they're 50 or older, provided that that's what they've earned from the employer, me, right? Um, and uh, there's no match involved. Now, the limitation becomes the 30,000. I, if I decide to do that second part where I'm the employer and saying, okay, I'm also going to contribute another 25% on behalf of my employees, which was good when it was just me, I, I would also have to do it for them. Yeah. So I still get 30,000, which is right. a lot better than just your regular uh, IRA. Right. The employee can do 30,000. If they want to, they can also do zero. Um, and, you know, um, it's it still gives me the benefit of that deferred uh, income, a taxable income and the growth of it without having to do more for my employees. Gotcha. OK, I'm going to play and follow a summary. You correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So we first started out where we weren't making a lot of money. So we did the traditional IRA or the Roth, depending on taxation at the time we put it in or later. Check. Got it. We progress along and we decide to get a solo 401 or a regular 401. I'm going to kind of use both. And we have it in our company. Now, it's still just us or a spouse. So we use the employee portion and we also use the company match. Now we got employees and we don't want to really do the company match. We can't afford to whatever. We still do the employee portion, which gives us more back than when we were the SEP IRA, but we just don't do the matching. Did I kind of summarize okay? You did. And somebody that's following really closely might, might say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, why would I ever do the solo 401k? The, it sounds like the four, the regular 401k and the solo 401k are the same. Oh, my God. That's my question, because I got the regular 401. The solo 401 came about. I don't understand the difference. Man, can you explain this? <laughs> yes. So everybody would every employer would want to have the solo 401k because they're free to establish. You do not have to pay a third party administrator that, like I said before, about fifteen hundred dollars a year to to establish it and then a thousand dollars a year to keep accounting on it because it requires ongoing tax filing a form 5500 is what it's called okay the solo 401k does not require any third party to establish or to file that form 5500 until the balance of it exceeds two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so if i were you know, as the employer, I would rather have the solo because it doesn't cost any money to establish and maintain. I save that thousand or two thousand dollars and then the ongoing costs. But like I said, the solo 401k is only available to solopreneurs and their spouses if they want to do that. So as soon as I have employees, I got to do the other one if I want to still shelter that thirty thousand dollars and the solo four hundred one is kind of a product that came away came around not just yesterday but more recently because of the solo entrepreneur and in that let's just take one moment to say when we are looking for an institution and I'm not saying this name as a suggestion but just to communicate we have something like a Vanguard or some company where these are set up in other words I can't go to my credit union and usually get these type of structures set up. There there are certain institutions that do the 
holding of the money and the investing of the stocks, if I can just make it that plain. Um, so we do have to have a institution that we choose to handle that for us. I just thought I'd be bringing that little element piece. Any part you want to add to that? Yes, those institutions are called custodians. And um, Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, uh, TD Ameritrade, the, the, they will all um, establish 401ks, Roth IRAs and regular IRAs and SEP IRAs free of charge, but they're not going to administer them. They're not going to keep the tax records on them. They say that that's up to you, but um, they, they'll you can make the accounts there for free at any of them. And you know what I just realized? So uh, uh, you just taught me something too. I have a solo 401 because I don't have to do any of the reporting. It is through Vanguard. I never recognized the name. I just went through Vanguard, said, this is what I am. And they asked me if I had any employees. I said, I'm never going to. So I have a solo 401 through Vanguard. That's what I actually have that I'm playing my little game as you speak. Very interesting. See, I hope you guys in the audience are seeing that this is a little bit more simple. It's complicated, but it's a little bit more simple and it's really got some great advantages. Okay. I, I just had an aha moment, David. I'm recovering from an aha moment. Continue. This is fascinating. Great. Okay. So if you're in the position of saying, well, I've got the money to, to shelter. Um, I don't, I don't want to um, uh, shelter for my employees. So I think the 401k is for me, or um, I don't have any employees, but I think I'm going to be sheltering a lot of money so that it's going to exceed this 250000 and I'll have to start doing reporting. And I don't really want to pay an administrator or do the extra reporting. What's available? Well, the SEP IRA, the SEP IRA, SEP is self-employed pension, okay. is available and also does not require any extra reporting. So... The SEP IRA is a good alternative, again, to somebody who's just solopreneur or a solopreneur and a spouse, because uh, the SEP IRA doesn't require the that extra reporting or the extra fees, but the limitations are that you have to have earnings in order to contribute to the SEP. Remember, in the 401k, you're the employee. Your you as whatever salary you're taking as in the employee is an expense to the company, but to you, you as the employee are able to shelter that money in the 401k. Cannot do that in the SEP. In okay, the SEP okay. So wow, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat what you just said, and the audience will hopefully benefit from this. So if I had like I made a paycheck to myself. And the paycheck actually ended up with net income zero. Let's just say zero because I took the paycheck. I can put the money in for my paycheck, but I can't because I don't have any earnings if it is a traditional. Wow. So if I want to take out the salary and have a negative net income, the SEP IRA will allow me to. Plus, if I do the traditional and I get over 250000 the SEP IRA is something I might want to choose to not get in the reporting structure. Did I mess that up, David? Correct me. And I think I might have messed a little bit up. You tell me. Uh, you, you're so close. So Okay. So the 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 solo 401k or the regular 401k allows you to make contributions regardless of whether you have net income okay but if it grows beyond 250,000 or you have employees you're going to have to start doing ongoing expenses for reporting gotcha the sep has no ongoing expenses for reporting but the you are only able to contribute the net, a percentage of the net earnings. So you can't say, oh, I'm going to put away money for myself as the employee. Ah, I get it. That's why right now, the amount I have put in my solo 401s under 250,000, and I'm doing both the matching, I'm still good with that. Oh, yes. This is really fascinating to understand because once you do, you see that the tools might change as your system goes. Yes. Wow. Okay. So that's where the SEP IRA comes from. Okay. Keep going. I'm having a lot of aha moments and I hope your audience, I'm not confusing you with my questions. You're learning with me. Keep going, David. Indulge me to just 
nerd out for one second because here's something that we do um, for our clients who have the solo 401k that's approaching that 250,000 threshold, which would require extra reporting and extra expense, is we make a tax-free rollover contribution to a regular IRA. That's a tax and fee-free contribution. It, re it now takes out everything from the solo 401k, so it goes to zero. IRA never requires reporting. Solo 401k is zero, and now I can build up again to almost 250000 without having to do the reporting. That is a beautiful thing because the reason I haven't reached my 250000 is because I have SEP IRAs where I have the money that I just... I open the solo 401 later, right? So I have money in other vehicles, so I haven't read the 250. Oh my God, guys. So what he's saying is when you get to the 250, you just do a rollover into a SEP IRA. You're back down to the reporting and you haven't changed your structure, which I set up my own 401 myself through Vanguard. It's a pain in the butt, okay? So I don't want to have to set up another structure. Beautiful, beautiful learning. Oh my God. I, I'm in the audience today, guys. I'm in the audience. <laughs> Keep going, David. <laughs> All right. So if we move along the structure now, what we're really looking for is what's going to allow me to shelter the most money from tax in this year. I'm not as concerned about having to make uh, whether I have to make contributions for employees or not, because I'm making so much money. Um, I'm not concerned about $1,500, $2,000 for ongoing administration. I'll hire somebody to that. I want to shelter hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is it possible for something like that? And the answer is- Okay, we're going to be there someday, guys. We're all going to be there someday. So let's listen. Okay, right. let's, let's listen. We're going to get there. Go ahead, David. So the answer is Yes. <laughs> There's something called a defined benefit or a cash balance pension plan. I've heard those words. Okay. Now, they are a little bit expensive to establish, and there's a lot of rules. So you most likely need to hire what's called a third-party administrator to take care of it. So it will cost two, three, maybe even $5,000 a year to maintain this. But if you're talking about sheltering $250,000 or more, then you're not really going to be so concerned about the $5,000 cost. That's a small amount. Absolutely. We've got a few questions, just two questions. And I want to go ahead and get those, David. First of all, I just want to say thank you. Oh, my God, this was so powerful. This is such a great understanding. Um, can an employee set up a solo 401? Okay. No. Great question. Uh, an employee is limited to if the employer has a 401k plan, they can contribute to that up to their age limitation and earnings limitation um, or and or a uh, an IRA. So they cannot do their own for solo 401k as an employee. Great question. Here's another great one from Christine. In order to contribute on behalf of your spouse, do you and your spouse have to file taxes jointly? No, oh. no. But your spouse has to have income from the business. So okay. it can't be that your spouse is a baker and you are you own a trucking company. The spouse has to be on the payroll in order to be able to to contribute. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. So I want to make sure that Lauren throw David's information into the chat again. David, if somebody wants to reach out to you, just to have a general conversation. Do you have that availability? They could just speak to you. You're a wealth of information. They might want to say, hey, David, I don't even know if I'm there yet, but this is my circumstances. How do you handle those type of calls? Sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I do free consultations for up to a half hour. Uh, happy to answer any questions that anybody has um, during that half hour time. If it makes sense for us to engage beyond that, we can talk about how that works as well. Perfect. You know what I love about speaking with you, David, and I think it goes back to your helping out your grandmother. You know, I've had conversations with professional experts all the time. I've done, you know, major banking, investment banking turnaround. So I, I'm, cu I'm accustomed to having conversations, but you have a conversation where I feel like we're on the same 
playing field. You know, you're talking with me. You're not talking at me. When I get an aha moment, you come back and you clarify. I really um, honor and respect that about you because when you have, the more complicated the topic is, the more you really appreciate when you have somebody that is not, um, is being with you wherever you happen to be at the time. I guess that's oh. what I'm trying to say. And so I, I really appreciate that. And you're going to be on the show again. I can tell you already, <laughs> I'm going to bug you because I feel like this time, and mostly because last time I bounced around more, this time we really got some information out there. So I can already see the the chat is going crazy with thank you, thank you, thank you. So I, I just want to say um, thank you so much. And even if we're going a little bit over, I want to throw it back to you. Any last words or thoughts you want to share with the audience? Well, th thank you, Lori. I mean, I, I it, uh, it, the best compliment that I could get is that I've been able to explain something in a way that's understandable. Um, and uh, yes, maybe it has to do with the fact that I started this with my grandmother, but it might even have to do with the fact that before that, I taught 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. So <laughs> That's true. That probably does have a lot to do with it. It might help. Um, the, 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 the only thing that I would like to leave your audience with is um, it's really what you said, which is if you're going to pay a dollar of tax, there is the opportunity to shelter that dollar from tax and put it towards your own retirement savings. And to not do that is really to throw money away. It's worthwhile to investigate to see what might be available to you so that you save more for yourself. Gotcha. Um, and in your business, you work with companies of all sizes, big, small. I'm yes, well, we work predominantly with individuals, but many of our individuals do own their own companies and they are of uh, many sizes and we have um, various uh, strategies that we'll employ with our clients to make sure that, as I've said before, they have the cash they need when they need it. Well, you know, I'm going to end with coming back to the beginning about your grandmother's story about being 98. You know, it's really interesting because I think back, I've always been self-employed pretty much. And I think back into my 20s when I was just like, oh, my God, am I going to be able to pay the bill? Am I going to be able to buy a quart of milk, yet alone retirement? But then, like I said, I started playing with these little retirement vehicles. And before I noticed, I'm at an age now where people go, are you going to retire? Or do you have to work? I go, I want to work. I, I love working. That's who I am. And then on the same side of that, as soon as I say that, David, I'm like, Oh my God, I could live to be 98. I'm a fanatical health person. I, you know, I'm basically one of those that could break a record. So I looked at it and I'm going to be 60 this year. And I'm like going, oh my God, that would be another 30 years. So I better have some money away. And so what I'm saying is what we're speaking about is really a fundamental topic because I don't care if I live past this show or I live 30 more years. I want to live with a quality of life that makes me happy. It doesn't have to be what makes my neighbor happy. I don't want to fly around the world, go on vacations. That's not who I am. But I want the money to do what makes me happy. And I want the freedom and the sense to know I'm okay. I can still stay on this planet Earth and have a damn good time. And so that's what we're really talking about. We can get in the minutia, the complication, but we're talking about be on the planet Earth and have a damn good time. Exactly. <laughs> and we, we should all have that. Everybody deserves that. I agree. Well, Lauren, welcome back to this. Is this not just been one of those um, mind boggling conversations? I think I was like everyone else in the chat, like just trying to hurry up and take down notes. This was really great information. <laughs> I know. I, I can't thank David enough in the way he explained it. And hopefully, you know, my questions added to some of the understanding and not the confusion. But I feel like this has just been remarkable. So, David, thank you for coming back on. We're going to get you back on again because I can tell from the chat this is a very hot topic to have. So once again, guys, next week, due to the fact that Lori cannot seem to recall the number of weeks in a month and totally <laughs> missed a week, I get a free week back. Um, I I'm going to depend on you, the audience, to be the guest next week. So join me next week. I don't know what we're going to talk about. We can talk about successful traits. We're going to talk a little bit about the power of questions and vulnerabilities in a business model. I know that's what I'm going to bring up. I'm going to bring up the managerial accounting 
the power of questions and recognizing your company's specific vulnerabilities and what you need to have these financial documents to monitor. So that's what I'm bringing up. You guys bring up whatever you want. If it's something I maybe need to think about a little bit, send an email to Lauren so she can send it to me so I'll be prepared to talk about it. Otherwise, we're going to use the chat and the questions and we're going to have a blast next week and we're going to go in every single direction. No topics not on the table. All of them are available to us. Okay. So I want to say, first of all, thank you for our frequent flyers to being there. Who's going to be one of our key people in the audience. I know I'm counting on you guys. Thank you to those that just joined the show. I appreciate it. And thank you for joining Small Biz Talk with your host, Lori Williams. Thank you, David. And as Lauren, as always, thank you for always being there behind the scenes. Lauren stays on a little bit after to answer any of your questions. If you're missing a link or something, she will take care of you. And if you need to reach me, want to reach me, want a one-on-one, Lauren gets you straight to me. Okay, guys, I will see you next week where we have a whatever happens, happens because we're going to be on planet earth and we're going to have a damn good time okay bye guys bye Lori. bye david <laughs> all right everyone go ahead and direct your attention to the chat i went ahead and um re-put in my is that correct english <laughs> my email address um go ahead and send your questions for next week's show or if you're looking to, and or if you're looking to set up an appointment with Lori, go ahead and uh, shoot me an email. I have David's contact information in there. And then there is finally that link to our YouTube channel, channel, excuse me, our playlist for uh, Lori's show. We look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, have a beautiful week and we will see you next Wednesday because there is an actual Wednesday next week, <laughs> January 24th, where we will um, take all your questions. All right, take care. Bye.